Does anybody have any questions about anything we have any? Uh, there's like 10 of you, I think, finally. I've got your names listed that showed up the other day, pay for credit, for extra credit. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to like highlight y'all's names, so then when y'all take the next test, I'll actually add a couple points on to the grade of the next test. Cool. Uh, the rest of y'all, if you didn't show up, if you can like show up with a printed copy of the schedule showing you actually have signed up for class in this right now, we'll give you extra credit points. Anyway, so um, I did record finally. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're gonna get a few, a little bit of statistics here, a little bit. Just you don't have to memorize them. You don't have to know them to test or anything. Just if you're out there on a cocktail circuit or something like that, you don't have like you know, just keep learning these numbers and you're good. But it's good to kind of have a ballpark idea of what what's going on here, and that's why we're looking at these numbers for a minute. And unfortunately, I don't have this these numbers for any newer than 2015. There's the, like the census, they get their information every 10 years, then they'll do a five-year thing in the middle and stuff, and there's always a lag when they connect to collect the data and give it out and that kind of stuff. And stuff. There's, so you can't, and I'd have to go digging around somewhere else to try to find newer numbers. but. These numbers don't really change a whole lot. Income for households, as you kind of expect. Where do we get most of our money? Wages. So in 2015, it was, well, I'll call it 70%, right? Then 11% of our income is coming to us in the form of retirement and Social Security. Is that a hard time we know low number? Well, yes, no, but then you think how many people either over 65 that are retired or collecting Social Security compared to how many of us are between 16 and 65 and are still working, right? So, okay, not so bad. Um, 6% interest. Yeah, I mean, all of this, and this includes if you buy bonds, we talked about corporate bonds last week in our one slide, whatever, yeah, last week, in our one slide, but, you know, if you buy bonds and you be buying government, you know, the, the savings bonds that grandma bought you when you graduated high school, those kind of things, you know, that, that's going to be interest, interest on loans, loan charts, you know who you are. 8% corporate profit, and it's 7% proprietor's profit. Sole proprietorship, right? Sole proprietorship, partnerships, corporations. Put them together. Business profit is only 15% of our income because this is the profits. The money that Matt and Connor made after baking the cakes, after buying all the sugar, the flour, and the wheat, and well, whatever it is they're buying, after paying their employees, after paying their electric bill, this is the money that's left over. And what are they doing with it? Putting it in a pocket, right? Or the proprietor's profit. Some of it's going into profit pocket, some of it may be staying in business to help the business grow. But it's uh, just, but as far as household, if you own shares of Microsoft or something like that, and they send you your 15 cent dividend check every three months, that would be falling at a corporate profit. If you're running your own business, running your own fruit stand, or running your own assassination for higher business or whatever, the profit you make from that, that would be your proprietor's profit. But business profit is only 50%. And less than 1% is rent. Who rents anything? Do any y'all rent anything to anybody else? You rent stuff to other people and they pay you rent payments? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, yeah, you'd be right sure. Yes, but the rent fees, their income. So, as you would suggest, expect, most of our income is coming from working. But is it 15% of that? Not. Both the corporation, so. More money, I mean, the more ownership you have, the more money you get. So, yeah, but I mean, but this is for Americans as a whole. That's not per household. That's oh. all 350 or 320, however many of All of us together. Take all of our incomes and add them together, and for all of us. So, Bill Gates and them all, their incomes would be coming into the profit, the dividend checks they're getting, the stocks, the bill ain't working. His wages are low because he ain't working. His income is high. Part of his part of that is going to be the corporate profit, the dividend checks he's getting from Microsoft. It's all people like Mark Zuckerberg.
Bird, uh, Sergey Brin, you know, the Larry Page, the guys around Google, they're getting wages. Tim Cook, Apple, you know, they're getting wages and they're getting profit too. Because they own stocks, so they're getting dividends from the stock, boom, and then they're getting wages because they work there. Uh, I think Tim Cook a couple years ago did what well, I think Bill Gates has done. Oh, not Bill, but Steve Jobs did it before, like, you know, my salary is a dollar. We had a bad year, you pay me a dollar. He's okay getting a dollar paycheck because of profit dividend checks that he's getting is millions and millions of dollars. So he's fine with that. It would be nice if I was financially able to say, hey, you just pay me a dollar. I think I'm retired. Mm -hmm. But, okay. Yeah. Um, I really need to. I thought I updated this. I'm suspicious that the household number has been changed. I just never changed the dates. Oh, 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 but anyway, median. What's the median? The middle. Did we talk about that in here? Okay. It's the middle of your road. It's the middle of a number. If you took all 150 million households, lined them up. In order, this is a household that has the least money, the lowest income. We're talking income here, not money. What because there's difference between wealth and income, right? You can have a wealthy person that doesn't have a job. You know, they're wealthy, but they don't have much income. Right? You can have somebody's got income but doesn't have wealth because they didn't get a whole bunch of money and they spend everything over, right? Income. The household has the least income over here, the household with the most income over here. At the top, we're all lined up, and then you come over here and you find that household in the middle. Household number sixty-two point five, or whatever it is. Sixty-two and a half million households are make less than us. Sixty-two and a half million households make more than us. What's the income of that one's family? Fifteen thousand five hundred two dollars a year. Half of the households in America are living off of. Less than $52,502 a year. Probably a lot of y'all are like, well, I can give me $50,000. Well, what if you're talking to a two income household? You got two people working and they're only bringing in $50,000 a year. They're only bringing in, each person's only bringing in $25,000 a year. Those people aren't making much more than $10 an hour. But so the best. Of that bottom half is two people making about ten, fifty, eleven dollars an hour, full time. Full time, or one person making it got a fifty thousand dollar a year job and the other one is staying home. But you think like so you got all those houses, households are making less than those minimum wage households are making seven and a quarter an hour. You got people that aren't working. Oh, there you go. So fifty thousand might sound like a lot to you, but when you start to divide it about fifty hours. 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, and then you talk about two households, two people households. But this should not come as a surprise to you. Um, I don't, I should have put you here, but I got the, the, I made this slide last year, just to realize the numbers. Um, the, I, I did not. And this is gonna be the median I hope it's the median for that group. It should be the median for each group. It might be the median, it might be the average. I'm not completely sure. Sorry. It's got, it's got to be the median. For people, households, where the heads of the household, not the kids, the heads of the household, the mom and the dad, or the or the just the you if you're a single person. The age, their age is between 15 and 24. Yeah, there are 15 year olds that are running our household. They've got managed to get themselves emancipated. Congratulations, thank you. All it does know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Their median household income is 27,000. As you get older, what do you expect? Your income will go up 25 to 44. Thousand year olds, that, that median household is $57,000 a year. Why? You're working more. A bunch of this group, some of them are still in high school, some of them are in college, and not working 40 hours a week. Where are these people? Yeah, we're working 40. They have the degrees. They have the degrees and they have experience. 
They have work experience and however many years worth of working and getting pay raises and this kind of stuff. All right. And there's not many people in this category here that have got a PhD, right? Except their name is Doogie Hauser, and y'all like you guys remember that show. All right. So um, yeah. all you doctors and lawyers, every one of them is going to be in this category above, right? But then as you get older still, that income, boy, you can't screw it up. Speaking of doctors and lawyers, I think. Okay. That group, the median income is 63,837. Oh, median, median, median. Yeah, median. So it's going up, which you would expect. You got even more experience. You're getting more of the. Instead of lower level management, middle management, you're getting upper level management, the CEOs, that kind of stuff, the people with the experience, right? That's showing up here. So this is higher. We did a super high. Super higher. Because what else is happening? There's two things that are happening here. Death and early retirement. Because not everybody's going to wait until their 65th, until the 65th birthday and then that's when they retire. You, you can actually start collecting Social Security 62. You got people like Melinda Gates, she ain't 65 yet, and she ain't working, she retired, right? Bill, you retired, Dina. So you have people that are dropping out of the workforce and not getting the income because they're retiring early. Good on them because they, they did well in this category, right? So they don't have to spend as much time here. The other thing is, they're dying off. Uh, maybe you graduated in class from high school. Have y'all lost anybody yet? Okay, like one person? What did you do? Like five. Four five, yeah. A lot of accidents, a lot of. Okay, well, guess what's going to happen? When y'all go to your 10 year reunion, there's going to be like 15, 20 people missing. When y'all go to your 20 year reunion, there's going to be like 30 people missing. When y'all go to your 80s year reunion, it's just gonna be you. Right? <laughs> and you don't make it that long. If you can even make it. Yes. Yeah. And then looking at most of you, I'm like, I'm kind of questioning. <laughs> but so so the, the growth does the growth <laughs> does continue, but it does slow down. And then what ends up happening, people 65 and over. <laughs> They're pretty much living off of retirement, right? Their retirement savings and their um, social security. And the median household income for that group is thirty-three thousand. Right, so more than us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got a later chapter that is going to depress the fire out of you, and hopefully, when the dust settles, you will start saving for retirement now. I'll tell you, start saving for retirement now. It's Kind of a lot easier to start saving now, but anyway. Isn't that what the old people are supposed to be doing? Um, no, because the life expectancy in the United States is 80 now. It, 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 72 is climbed up higher. The women have passed 80, and actually the men are not quite 80, but they're, I mean, it's like 70, 7, 78. And guess what? There's more women than men as far as when it comes to older people. I mean, it's scary. We're more likely to do. Uh, I'm not going to ask how many of those people that passed away in your high school class, how many guys, how many girls. Exactly. It's just something yeah. to say. There's a reason why our insurance rates are higher than y'all's, ladies. <laughs> but market drop off here. You're living off of your retirement savings, you're living off of Social Security. Uh, oh, and there's one other reason why that number. So I'll get bigger. I quit touching the board like that way. But it's lower because we're, 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 we're living off our retirement savings. Well, it kind of sucks that our retirement savings apparently is a whole lot less our income when we retire is a whole lot less than our income when we're working, right? But there's something else going on here. Dying off. Yes, part two. Yes, part two. <laughs> yes. You're getting back down to the single, fam single family incomes. 
Single person income, single person families. Let's try that word. Because, you know, just grandma and grandpa both made it to 65. They retire every day, and grandpa, because of his eating all the meat and not eating the vegetables, that kind of crap, he dies at age 67, and grandma's hanging on until age 89, right? So it's a single person household thing going on again. So. <laughs> It's hard work. I'm not hard. But I may be bored. You may be bored. <laughs> so, what do our households look like in America? Well, kind of as you expect, the biggest slice of maybe you'd expect the biggest slice of pies are two person households, 33%. Second in line is one person households, single fold. Y'all, how many of you moved out? Only one of you. The rest of you living at home, scratching up your parents. Screw it on you. I think I've told you before. I know they get on you every love and last nerves the whole time, as long as you can. Just, I know it sucks that you can't come home and crank the stereo wide open loud because they're like, turn it down! Because you're in the next room. Yeah. Where are you now? Especially don't move out until spring. Because last thing you want to do is like move out in the wintertime and then you, you got all the cost of moving all and then you got a heating expense to go along with. Oh. Wait, just wait an extra couple months. Is that eight down to eighteen? Oh no! Well, because I went off to college, but then I came, I came, I came back home, and then I lived after graduating, and I lived with my parents for four months, five months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got it. But anyway, so one person households a quarter of us, two person households a third of us. This two person households maybe husband and wife. Or a baby, mom and junior, or junior at, right? Single, single parent household. So you have to, so some of these households are going to be a one income household, even though it's a two person household, right? Your single person household is obviously a one, person, one income household, right? So then you get to three person households, are only 17%, four person, 14, only 2% of the households are six person households, only 1% are seven or more people. Seven or more people? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, and I, bizarrely, more than 1% of the families that I know are in that category. My wife is one of nine girls. Wow. Yeah. And, got, and the guys I did construction work with, they were a family of eight kids. Like, yeah. this family you're not with. There was a family that was near me when I went to high school. That they were about that number. They got their family car was an airport limo. Uh -huh. <laughs> they take a station wagon, splice it in the middle, and put two more rows of seats there. And that's what that car was that they were driving around in. But anyway, it's ugly and the greatest school bus Oh, I mean, just the, the big eleven person vans. How big? So that's why they had to do what they did. Anyway. Okay. I, I think so. Um, right. What would it mean here? Uh, our households are changing. Going back in time to the year 1970, when a fantastic phenomenal economic structure was born. All the way up to, oh, we'll go to 2008. That's the latest numbers I've been able to get, but this trend is going to continue. What do we have here? Back in 1970, 40% of the households were married couples with children. 40% of the households were married couples with children. The next 30% were married couples without children. 70% of the households were married couples. With or without kids. So 70% were married, so only 30% of the households were not married people. We'll just start with that piece. In 2008, and there's two numbers together, and it's not even half. And those numbers are getting smaller still. Where are the married couples going? Baby boomers. Married Maybe couples dying off. No, no, no. <laughs> what ends up happening is, let's look up here. Well, if they ain't getting married, then you've got the guys, you got the ladies. 
So what's happening? Let's see, single men was, I'm going to pick on it. Single men, 14%. That's what no, oh, single women. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> single women went from 14% to 50%. Not that big of a change. So, there's a change happening. Okay, there's a whole lot less married couples, but it ain't single women living at home. What's happening? This group is getting bigger. <laughs> this group is getting bigger. What is this group? These two groups? That group, men living alone. The number of households of single dudes has doubled. Single parents with kid, almost double. Because let's face it, 99% of the time, where does the kid stay with? Mom. So that other 1% of the time, that's that group here, right? Well, no, because that's very good. Wait, 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 wait. So, most of the half the time away ends up happening. It ain't like we're getting less kids. We're still getting the same number of kids, but that's the what we're what we are seeing, especially in the 80s, 90s, what, 200, early 2000s. The increase in kids being born for non-married couples, and the increased instance of doors. So these are the changes we're getting. But interestingly enough. Listen, there's some shrinkage going on here now. I really need to look at that number. This shrinkage here, the, oh, excuse me. Well, well, these are continuing to shrink as well. Because people, y'all say, y'all, what are y'all? Millennial, y'all are millennials. Y'all are like right millennials. millennials. Yeah. Gen Z, post millennial, millennial square. Yeah. Millennial square. <laughs> <laughs> Gen Z. We don't get married. Y'all aren't just big of a hurry to get married. And I guess the millennials aren't just big of a hurry to get married. Y'all actually are more interested in career. So y'all the millennials were they're more willing to put off kids' marriage for a couple of years to get the education first. Um due to the Smartphones, video games, that kind of stuff, Facebook and Instagram, that kind of stuff. What is a lot of our kids, teenagers, what are, what are they doing? They're going home and they're staying home and they're playing video games, they're doing Instagram, Facebook, and whatever. They're sitting across the table from one another. When they do go out on a date, they're sitting texting one another across the table. So, what are they not doing? They ain't have as much teenage sex. So, the teenage pregnancy rate has dropped dramatically in just the last few years. I, can't, I was here, I just heard something about that like a week ago, and I can't remember what the numbers were. But just, it's dropped dramatically. Because kids ain't thinking about hooking up on Friday night, they're hooking up online on Friday night, right? Nothing like just anyway, I can make some jokes that anyway. <laughs> so, so, these demographics are changing. So, is, there, is this information going to have an impact on businesses? Yeah. yeah. Is it going to have an impact on the economy as a whole? Yeah. yeah. This stuff, we were talking about this in my marketing class just last week. I had this exact same table on the screen. Fewer families, fewer large families. You know, a lot of the kids, a bigger chunk of them are single mother households, that kind of stuff. So we don't need as many family size portions. The famous size meal will be eight people, six, six people. We don't need it. What are we needing more of? Single guys, what do y'all think of the food? Some of you come out of microwave and you got it in two minutes. Bam. That's right. You the line and suck the hungry man all the time. Uh -huh. make jokes that hungry man should speak with it. What is a lonely man? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if y'all ever watch the cartoon uh, Futurama, maybe I'd use the Simpsons. Yeah, they got a bachelor shower. It's like a dog food guy. <laughs> bachelor food. Bachelor thing with oh Joe get Joe Bachelor Joe. Oh, go single guys. We just want something quick. Boom. Uh, the single women living on their own. Well, they're are they just going to take forty five minutes to be cooking themselves nice? No, they want convenience. The single mother with how many kids? What do they need? Is she working? 
Uh, yeah, because she's the only income for the household, right? So she's working, so she comes home at 5, 5, 30 in the afternoon, and she's got three kids trying to set the house on fire, so what she needs? Something quick. Something quick. Quick and convenient is growing when it comes to food. Where the whole sit down, nice show, you know, or whatever you see from the 70s, 50s sitcoms, by the family sitting together in the meal and where that crap don't happen anymore. It just, we just don't have the time for it. Then, then married couples, you know, what are we doing? Married couples without kids? Well, like, I'm not going to sit down. So they go out and eat. Restaurant eating has grown humongously to where I think it, right now half of the food money in America is being spent on restaurant food versus grocery store food. So we're doing as much damage in restaurants as we are or somebody else is cooking our food than we are our own food. The dentist is going to go as far as what kind of cars are we making? What kind of clothes are we making? What kind of... Uh, our population is changing and that's going to have impacts. Yes. So far, up until the last few years, well, at least we're sort of our population growth is still being kind of steady, but guess what? If these trends kind of continue, this could start slowing down. So we could end up with a negative growth rate. We have more people dying every year than we have being born every year. That's been happening in Japan for the last few years, several years. And so they're finding themselves in the squeeze. They're having a harder and harder time finding people they need in order to work in the businesses and that kind of stuff. Just because they're fewer and fewer. So we might find ourselves in that situation too. Right now. Like, don't they eat healthy food? Don't they eat healthy food? And, uh, it's not the fact of food, it's the fact that they basically, they're developing a relationship with technology more than they're actual people. What is it? That's an actual like thing where people are falling in love with like an AI, <laughs> other than actual real people. I got married in BS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and part of it is, is the, the, the geography. You looked at Japan is small. And so if a bunch of people, small land area, a bunch of people wanting a little bit of land, so high demand, low supply, what is it, what's happening to prices? Land prices are insanely high. So the, the rule of thumb is you need to have at least an acre of land per cow. So are they raising many cows in Japan? No, because hey, you get a couple acres, you can put up an apartment building, right? Make a whole lot more money. So any cows that are raised in Japan, very freaking expensive. If y'all heard homemade beef, but is expensive? Is it good? I don't know. Is it different? Not really. What it, it costs a green eye fortune to grow it because the land that cow is growing on is so speckling expensive. So consequently, you think the Japanese diet, a lot of food they're getting is like food that they can get not on the island. They like fish. You know, they eat a lot of that. And is that healthier or not? Well, yeah, maybe the fish, is, as long as it doesn't have mercury in it, maybe it's okay. As long as it didn't need a Fukushima nuclear plant leaking it, maybe those are okay. I don't know. So I can't really speak to because their diet healthier than ours. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. And I can answer that, but it's yes. It is a lot. Oh, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. So, let's take our households. Well, one to one at 15. We got a lowest income household over here, highest income household over here. And gates, right? That's the thing we're doing. So, what we can do is we're going to divide this, these households into five groups. Quintile, quint, five. We're going to do them in four tiles and then do them in four, right? Just in percentiles. Y'all heard of percentile and y'all heard of SAT and that kind of thing. That's dividing it in 100 blocks. We divide them. To five blocks. You have the lowest quintile, the second, so the lowest, the 20% of the households with lowest income. Then the next group is the next 20% of the households with lowest income remaining. Then you have the third group of 20% of the household, the fourth group of 20% of the households, and then that fifth group of the households that are making all the money. We have names for them. Lower class. Lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class, upper class, rich folk. Somebody that my next wife is going to be coming to be full of if I like. But no, I'm not going anywhere. My wife has me very right rich folks. Today's her birthday, so I did. Yeah. It, it is not her first 29th birthday, so there we go. Thank you, 
age groups. Lower class is bottom, 20% of the households. So we're talking about 30, almost 30 million households are making between zero. Uh, this came straight from the census. The, the 2010 census, the newest numbers 2010 census did have was by 2006. But they ain't doing another census for another two years. <laughs> it's kind of kind of hard to find these numbers. Same with another. So uh, the trend is still similar. The numbers are the dollar amounts may be a little bit different, but the percentages are still similar, actually getting a little bit worse. The lowest one fifth of households are making between zero and eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. 20% of the households are living on an average of $11,000 per household. And if you look at remember that chart that we just had, three quarters of those households at least are going to be two or more people, right? Because only a quarter of the households are one person households, right? So a good chunk of these households are living on $11,300, on average, $11,352 a piece. Does that sound like any of y'all? Well, yeah, no, y'all are all living home with your parents. Congratulations. Except for Lassara. She's fighting a good fight. You go, girl. So, so after the cut, 20% of households are living off of 3.4% of the money of the income. So, this second group, the lower middle class. The average household income there is $28,777, 8.6% of the money. You would think that whole fair distribution of income thing that we talked about the first week of the class, well, it should be 20% of the households get 20% of the money, right? So 40% of the households should be get 40% of the money. Uh -huh. The bottom 40% of the households combined is only making 12%. 40% of the households in America are living off of 12% of the income. And it's more than 40% of the people are in those 40% of the household. Because lower income households tend to have more people than higher income households. Because higher income households tend to be people that have more education and that kind of stuff. And people that have more education tend to have fewer kids and have them later in life. So. 40% of the households, more than 40% of the people are living off of 12% of the money. Yeah, all their income. All their income. Look at this average here. Just for this group, well, I'll talk about this group. 28,777. If that is a single person household, that person is making. Um, do about thirteen dollars an hour, fourteen dollars an hour. Is nice. One person, but what if it's a two-income household? You got two minimum wage workers, right? Right now, but this is as of two thousand six. I mean, we got we've got to adjust that now because of the Affordable Health Care Act. So now people are only working twenty-nine hours a week and reporting inflation. These people here, eleven thousand. It's only about six dollars an hour if they're working forty hours. Just like they ain't working forty hours a week, so they got to give eight, six, seven, and four. All right. She wanted that. Eighteen thousand. That's going to be about nine dollars an hour, a little over nine an hour for one worker. Is that working full time? That would be one worker full time. So, one worker full time, nine, nine and a quarter an hour. Ain't much higher than minimum wage, right? A quarter of the households are living on not much more than one minimum wage income. Okay, I'll get the My first is pricey with a later chapter, but start taking that. Because guess what? A bunch of these people are senior citizens. A bunch of these people are grandma. Your grandma, my grandma. Well, my grandma isn't here anymore. Here. 
Uh, we'll get to this later this semester, but I'll tell you now, the average Social Security check comes in about $900 a month, $900, $950. So that comes up to being about $11,000 a year. If you decide you're only going to use Social Security, your Social Security check as your sole source of income when you retire, plan on living a minimum wage in systems. Because that's about the way you quit the system. And guess what? As you're older, your health care expenses go up. But can you afford to live a minimum wage existence as a start saving? Yeah. Okay. Start saving as soon as you graduate and you get a real job that's paying you more than seven and a quarter an hour, right? Because y'all are college students, they only bring in the big bucks, yeah. Uh, the third group, the middle group, they're supposed to be making 20% of the money, but they're only making 14.7% of the money. The upper middle class, they're supposed to be making 20, they're making 23. Woohoo! But the top 20% of the households are bringing in half of the money. The upper class, 20%, these are your doctors, lawyers, everybody who's making above 88, a household income above 88,000 is considered to be in the top 20%. Of course, that's a middle. So do those average, or I said the income dollars, it's like from zero to 18, 1834, do those numbers reflect the, like that group of 20% of people? Yes. So those numbers are constantly changing. Yes. So that group of 20%. Yes. Uh, you have people moving from one group to the next group and the amount of the income and then Whenever it, like minimum wage changes, like the Amazon doing their pay wage, jumping, bumping it up to $15 an hour here in another month or so, that's going to, these things are always fluctuating a little bit. But that's why I'm like, that's just a spot in time. Just sort of give you an idea of what's going on. I think I have it here. Yeah. The top 20% gets half of the money. The top 5% are bringing home almost 21% of the money. Yeah. So even among the rich people, there's the richer. Right. There were about six categories. Um, I used to have the number. I want to say like top 1% was like 10% of the money. I, I, no, I don't know where that number is. I couldn't, yeah, it was an old number and I couldn't re verify it. So that's why I figured that 5% number not right. Now. But that's around 10% of the income going to the top 1% of the household. I know who they are. Marry them. <laughs> or blackmail them. Okay. Where do, what do we do with our money? These percentages do. I, 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 uh, I know I've, I've got some missing data there. Right? Mm -hmm. Do I update these sometimes? But um, where does our money go? Let me back up a bit. The first thing. Our, our paycheck, first thing that happens to our paycheck, before you even get it, taxes come out of it, right? And taxes, on average, it ends up being 11%. Okay, uh, they, they take more than 11%, they're taking 50% out of your check, but then they're giving a bunch of back. What do you enable? Not counting out of this, not counting the Social Security, that's if you're ordered to take an out Social Security, that appointment, that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying, your income, tax, part of what you're taking out of the check. They're taking it out and then they're giving some of it back. So it's going to average out to 11%. For everybody, Bill Gates, even, it, all of us lump together, only 11% of our paychecks are going into the hands of Aunt Jean and Uncle Sam and Cousin South Hill or Board of Town Council. I thought you made more than enough. No, you're still getting tax credit. Uh, well, it depends on how much they took it. I mean, no. Oh, if you make more than fifteen thousand, then yeah, you're not getting any money back. But you let's just get some. Yeah, you get some of it back. Even even me, you know, I'm, I don't know what I make an hour, but I'm like, I still get some money back. And kids with tax credits. Yeah. Um, but you know, I get some of it back. But y'all get all of it back. But Bill Gates only gets. Some of it back. 
Like I said, standard deduction. You know, they don't start taxing. They're not supposed to start taxing you until after you've already made fifteen thousand dollars. Well, they started taking money out of your paycheck, your first paycheck. So they've got to give you back that money they took from you that they should have taken from you for that first fifteen thousand dollars worth of your not on the plan working this year. So taxes first. Then what was it that your father told you when you were eight years old and first started getting money? Put some money in the savings account. Don't put it in the bank at the beginning of the week. Don't wait until the end of the week and say, well, if I have any left over, I'll put it in the savings account. Because do you ever have any money left over? So put it in the beginning. Our national savings rate is like three and a half percent. That's why technology is so great now, because you can have it direct deposited into your bank from your check. Yes. As you pay. Yes, direct deposit. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. And you can set up an automatic transfer to go from your checking account to check. check. It's a beautiful thing. Back in the 90s, our savings rate was a negative number. We were spending more than we were saving. More than we were saving. And more than we were making. We were just saving using credit cards, taking money out of our savings account, but so our savings getting smaller. So what's left? We spend it. We spend 85% of our money. Americans as a whole. We spend 85% of our money. Y'all in here. Y'all ain't making money, you're getting it back. Congratulations. Your income tax, not I'm not counting at six and a quarter percent this year for for Social Security. Okay, so no ahead, they ain't really taxed. Okay, savings. Y'all know y'all ain't putting nothing in the bank. Don't be lying to me. Lie to you. Okay, so what, what are y'all doing? Y'all are spending 94% of your money, right? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the world. If you're self employed, you're spending it all, right? That's what we do, right? But overall, we ain't saving a whole lot. People like Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, they're, they're taking on the saving course and help even things out. Oh, what are we spending our money on? Durable goods. Things you can drop on your foot and they'll hurt you. Like a car, furniture, chainsaw. Fall, fall on your foot. Yeah. You can have them. Then you're out there changing the tire and you, the jacket's all balanced and it falls down and you can have them. So be sure when you change the tire that the jack is sitting on something stable. Non-durable products. Things really the definition between durable and non-durable is this gonna last more than 30 days. Kind of. Yeah. Is it gonna last? Food doesn't last or maybe a year. Food doesn't last. It's non-durable. It, 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 you eat it and it goes away, you have nothing to show for it. It rocks. Gasoline. We burn it up going up and down the highway. Clothes are non durable. Let's think about your clothes. It doesn't hurt when you drop it on your foot. So. It doesn't hurt when you drop it on your foot. True. <laughs> well, I don't know. Good pair of boots. Maybe. Yeah. But um, let's think about a t shirt. You buy it, you wear it once every week or two, right through the spring, the summer, the fall, and then what? Do you, do you wear it next? No. So maybe you only have really wearing that t-shirt like 20 times before you get rid of it and put it in the goodwill pile, right? So that's kind of disposable, right? I'll close it up. Shoes, we get more mileage out of them, but you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, good, uh, shoes are only going to last six months a year, especially if middle school kids, they're only going to last a few months, but you got to get the latest and greatest, so you don't get the good. Right. But just, it's, clothing is going to actually be a non durable good. Your cell phones, uh, they're probably going to fall under non durable. Especially yeah. looking at the screens on some of y'all's phones. <laughs> they actually have more. Then the other thing, so those are goods, and then the other thing is services. Healthcare, housing, recreation. Yeah. You go to a movie. You're getting non durable good of popcorn, but then but the bulk of that ticket was uh, what well, the ticket was to watch the movie. And that was the service. A lot of the stuff that we buy, and I'm sure I have it on the next slide, but I'm not sure. Oh, not. Yes. <laughs> Most of the money we spend is on services. Think about what you're spending money on. Your direct TV bill as a service. You can't put it in your pocket and save it for later, right? Your electricity, you can't put it in your pocket and save it for later as a service. It's not something you can take and resell. 
You can't save it for later. It's a service. It's something somebody's doing for you. When you go to the restaurant and you order a steak, you're getting three dollars worth of meat and charging you fifteen dollars for it. That other twelve dollars is a service. Somebody cooking it for you. Somebody providing you lights while you're there. Somebody refilling your water cup. Somebody washing the dishes when you're done. That's the stuff you're paying for when you're going at the restaurant. Mostly it's a service. Only a little bit is the food. So cell phone. Your cell phone bill. You're paying seventy-five dollars a month. You know who you are. Well, like. 30 of that is going to pay for the phone, and the other 40 of it is paying for the signal. Um, then you get into things like any of you, you know, just you know, impressed him because it is whatever career. He actually had the bodyguard that he hires on the weekends. That's service. Um, your home phone, service. Your home internet, service. If you rent, uh, Sam says he rents the apartment. Where do you run at? Yep. Running a house, that's a service. You're not buying the house, no, you're running the house. So you bought, you're renting, you're buying the service of housing, shelter for the 30 days. That's what you're getting at. Most of the money we spend is on services. Then non durable goods, food, and that kind of stuff works. Last time you bought a TV or piece of furniture. That's good. We don't. All right. You know, and the reason why these numbers are high is because, well, occasionally somebody's going to buy a house or buy a car. And you're huge. You've got that three hundred dollar car payment, so your payment is huge but compared to your monthly income. But then you think you got the car payment, insurance, service, right? <laughs> car insurance, renters insurance, health insurance, and then the gas that goes into the car. Gas is not good. durable good. Yeah. So you think you, only, only low around 10, 11, 12 percent of our money is on durable goods. That's what the fun stuff is. Uh, the non durable goods. 22%. Uh, the, your Xbox, durable goods. Your Xbox, goal, whatever, one account, whatever, to play the video games on that. That's the service. All right. the, the games, the game disc would be non durable. Think about it. You buy a DVD movie. You, pay, you, you buy the Blu ray. You just paid $15 for the disc. You pay for what? 15 cents worth of plastic. The rest of it is service. For people, the actors and the directors and producers to make the movie, for the people to print the movie onto this disc, for the people at Walmart to take it out of the back room to stay, knock it on the floor, kick it three times, step on it, and stick it on a shelf, and then the person that's going to stand and stare at you while you check it out of self checkout, right? <laughs> Services. I love Walmart. Please don't sue me. Um, I'm my microphone doesn't have here anymore. Uh, this is just another section. This used to be in another chapter, and I just and I just left the divider here. The public sector. What we were looking at was private sector. What you and I are doing is households, the businesses we're running, the money that we're spending. Well, we spent a few minutes giving the government their love. We've got the three levels: federal, which is Uncle Sam, state, and Virginia, and then local, your county, your city. You know, that's where you give your mayors and county council, school boards, and they come from. How do they get their money? Taxes. I used to have yes, taxes. What kinds of taxes? Okay. I used to have these transition out uh, apparently part of my slide when I switched it to a little slide. Federal tax, federal government taxes are income. They ask everybody in America, how much money did you make? Oh, you made that much? Give me a chunk of it. <laughs> Just that easy. The state, they do income taxes, but then they also do sales tax. They ask, well, how much dough do did you find Virginians? How much money did you make? Well, we take a chunk of it. And then how much are you spending? We'll take a chunk of that too. Where local governments, they use they do property tax. Okay, how much property do you own in the area? Well, we'll take a percentage of that. And they'll do sales tax. How much are you spending in our area? So the vote is, I mean, who's getting the vote? How are they dividing the sales tax? No, the, the, the local tax is the, the local sales tax is tacked onto the state tax. Like the state tax, is like four and a half percent. And but then you go into some places and you buy something and they're gonna charge you six percent because the city's getting one and a half and then the state's getting four and a half, so they're gonna take six percent. We have three different kinds of taxes. There's three different kinds of people that we're targeting here. And we have the three different kinds of taxes charged at different rates because we want to make sure that it, we've got three different kinds of people. 
and we want to make sure we get money out of each of them. Income tax is taxing who? No, people have an income. Sales tax is taxing people who spend. Think about Melinda Gates. Income, maybe zero. But is she spending? Yeah. yeah, we want to get money out of her, right? Yeah. So the sales tax is catching spenders. Income tax is catching people with an income. Because otherwise it would suck for somebody. They're making all this money in income, 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 and if they're not spending it, we ain't getting any of that. They're being a leech on society, sucking away all our money, and they're giving nothing back. So if they're spending, well, we're going to get something back, right? If they're making money, we're going to get something from them. No, property tax great. is taxing what? Uh, cars. There's another word for property, a little more generic. Yeah. Yeah. That was, mm, a little more generic. I used the word a little bit ago, begins with the W. Wealth. Wealth. Oh. Wealthy people. This is people, you know, rich people that got a bunch of money and they ain't got a job anymore. And they don't go to town very often to spend money because they hate people. They just want to take out the money they already have. So wealthy people who have no income and don't spend are still going to get taxed. So they got you. Yeah, we're taxing the stuff you have, the stuff you buy, and the money that you bring in. So everybody's going to be hit by at least one of these. Most of us are going to be hit by all three of these. But here's a depressing thought. Be glad that you're paying taxes. Because think of what your life would be if you weren't paying taxes. If you didn't have an income, that would suck. If you didn't have any stuff, that would suck, right? The fact, that they're taking, the fact that they're taking taxes away from you means that you're doing something. The more taxes they're taking from you means that you're getting more income, you got more stuff, right? Be proud to be paying taxes. I know, I just, uh, I just, Take that for what it's worth in there, but okay. yeah, just I had to say it. Okay. So do these taxes make sense for the different levels? Yeah. yeah. Could the federal government really do a sales tax? Uh, I, mean, I guess they could, but think of the pain. Oh, oh, I so wish I had my little thing before I could do my sound effects, but I devil I can't I have a beep, but how much of a pain in a beep would it be for the federal government to do sales tax? Every purchase in every store in the United States would have to get cataloged yet again and report and extra money would have to be collected and it would all have to be reported to the federal government and money sent in for every mom and pop store, gas station, whatever in America. How much would pay that the federal government would have to be keeping up with every last second transaction there would be. Every time you go to the gas station to buy gas, the federal government would have to know about it. Every time you go and buy a candy bar, the federal government have to know about it. Is that a nightmare? Yeah. Yeah. Instead, what do they do? We usually have one, maybe two, or three sources of income. One job, maybe two jobs, and then our interest on the $12 we have in our savings account. Right. So what, what are our tax forms or what? Our income. They just ask all of us, how much money did you make from your job, from your gambling, and from your savings account? And they give us a percentage of it. Income tax is easy. For the federal government to do sales tax is hard for the federal government to do. How about property tax for the federal government to do? How in the crap can somebody in Washington, D.C. tell me the value of the land that I have here in Southern Virginia? What do they know? I got a question. So, you know, for um, the trade tax and all that, that it goes under the federal? Yeah, that's federal. How can somebody in Washington, D.C. know, okay, tell me, figure out the value of my land that I have here. How can somebody in Washington, D.C. tell me the value of my car that I have here? They can't. Not unless they're riding around all over the entire United States. They have inspectors driving around everywhere, looking at everybody's plane, looking at everybody's car, doing it on a yearly basis. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for the federal government to do property tax. It doesn't work for the federal government to do sales tax. Does it work for a local government to do an income tax? 
No, because we don't want our neighbors knowing how much money we make, right? And who's our local government but our neighbors? And then how can, you know, what is going to be the mechanism for your little local government to be able to get income reported information from all of your employers and all that kind of stuff? Especially, if, oh, you live in South Hill, but your job is in South Hill. So that business ain't reporting to the South Hill government how much money you make. But if you live in South Hill, but you work in North Carolina, local government can't do income tax. Federal government can't do property tax, can't do sales tax. State government, they're kind of in between. They're not going to be sending people all over the state and be looking at the backside of our farm and saying, yeah, your land is kind of swampy and it ain't worth a whole lot. They ain't doing that. They're just going to ask, okay, for all the stores in Virginia, how much money did you bring in? How much money went into that cash register? Give us a percentage for every store in Virginia. Pretty simple. And then for every one of you working in Virginia, how much money did you make working in Virginia? Give us a chunk of it. And your, federal, your Virginia income tax is a lot lower than your federal income tax. Okay, and the state rate might only be like 6% or something like that. You might do it if you, like, it'll get up to like 15%, 10 to 15%, or your federal government, you can get up 20, 25, 30, 35, 40%. It's lower, but that's okay because they're getting an extra four and a half percent out of every penny. It makes sense to do them this way, and so that's that's why we have the system. So everybody is going to get taxed, whether you got a job or not. You're doing something in the economy, so some level of government's going to get money out of you as a result. Same thing with the federal state tax income tax. You know about the state tax, um, low local the state gets some percent out of the sales tax, they do that federal tax. Uh, no, the federal tax, tax, that just goes to Washington visa. That's that check you write in April, or the check you're looking back for. They take it out of your paycheck. So that doesn't go through the state and local government. But but the states, they're nice, and they're going to ask, well, how much money did you tell them? Well, same did you make this year? Okay, and then we want a certain percentage of that, so your numbers on your federal return. End up on your state tax return, those who will take the accounting to be 61. Yeah, that is it. Are you taking it now? So, what the crap's all this money for? They got us coming and going, everybody paying at least some taxes, but except we all young people, right? Gradually. Well, to provide the government. Well, why the crap do we have the government in the first place? Services is the word. Remember from our uh, circular flow model, Sir, services is the word. We have the government to provide the legal framework for when we have disputes with one another, when we have disagreements with one another, that's what the court system is about. Setting up the rules for how we conduct business. Come up with the rules of, you take a piece of paper and you say, I'll give somebody $5,000, then you sign your name on the bottom of it. Well, what is that? You got to pay. Because you just did a contract thing. Because if we don't have some kind of rules for how to do that, then, well, as you sign a piece of paper, I'm not going to say take even my $5,000 an hour to regulate. Right? We got to have some kind of framework, some kind of rules for how we interact with society. Even rules for um, red means stop, green means go. Drive on the right instead of the left. Right. We have to have some kind of rules in place for us to get along, and that's rule number, rule number one of the government. Control externalities. It's a fun word. That, that's your uh, other, when you're in your high society, social dependence. What's the word of externality? Uh, the root word. External. Outside. We have another word for this in another chapter called the spillover. There are things that happen to people that impact more than just those people. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. True or false? You are going to benefit because of your college education. True. True. True or false? Other people in your community will benefit because you got a college education. True. It should be true. Because you have a college education instead of not having a college education, well, you're going to have a job hopefully making more money, right? 
And so if you're making more money, what are you going to be doing? Spending 80 some odd percent of it, right? So you're going to be paying more sales tax than you were before. That puts more money into the pocket of the local government, right? Sure, you're going to be paying more income tax for money not the same amount of pocket. Sure, the government gets more money because you got a college education versus not. Yeah. So even if you don't have kids, the school system is better off because you got a college education because some of the money that they're getting out of you is going to be going to improve the schools. So my kids get the benefit because you got a college education. Because the schools that my kids are going to are better off because we got more money <coughs> from you than we would have before because you got a college education. And guess what? You also be more educated. Hopefully, you're going to be a more educated voter and be better able to make appropriate decisions in the voting booth each November to get better qualified candidates into office so we can have a better, more reliable government. <coughs> Benefit when we have an education. If you have an education, is more likely to keep a job? Yeah. You're less likely to lose a job, less likely to be on unemployment. Which means less likely for the government to my tax money to have to go into a bin that's going to be paying you because you're sitting at home unemployed, right? Or the more education you have, Preston, the less likely you are to turn to a life of crime, Preston. You know who you are. So then, otherwise, if he didn't get the education, he just keeps wallowing in this life of crime and that kind of stuff. And eventually, the cops catch him, and then some of my tax money, your money, is going to pay the jailers to keep him in prison, right? That's a negative externality. Him going to life of crime. Negative externality, negative spillover. You're driving down the road. Jenny is driving, Jenny to the eye. Jenny's driving down the road with a Dr. Pepper. She takes that last sip and she sees a street, street sign coming up. So she rolls down the window. She throws a bottle over the cab trying to hit the sign. She misses. The bottle's laying near the side of the road. Who picks that up? Does Jenny turn around and pick up what she littered? No. Because if she was that kind of person, she would have thrown the bottle in the first place. Didn't do bad. So who, pay, who picks it up? I don't know. Preston, <laughs> Preston where his orange jump to? <laughs> yes, but guess what? The prison system has to have a van to drive him out there to pick it up, pick up the trash. They got to spend money on trash bags for him to put the bottle into. And they got to pay money to the guards standing in a shotgun and making sure he doesn't skip off into the woods. Not like you can blend in very well wearing a jump, orange jumpsuit. So, where's the prison system going to get all their money? Our taxes. So, because Jenny is littering, my taxes are higher. Because Preston is a criminal, my taxes are higher. Those are spillovers, those are externalities. But because some of y'all are getting a college education, you pay more in taxes, so my taxes aren't higher. It, they would be even higher still if you weren't. Doing good. But our, all of our taxes could be lower if Preston, you would just straight up them, man. <clears throat> right. So, there's rules in place to control externalities. There's absolutely no consequences. Jenny doesn't think there's any consequences. What she need to do? Yeah, I see street sign. She could chuck the bottle. So, what do we do to keep her from chucking the bottle? Fine yeah, that sign that she's throwing a thing at says fine $500 for littering. We have cops every once in a while. To keep people from, well, I, you know, it's all about me, and I got to get to where I got to get to as fast as I can get to it. We mash the gas pedal, and we're driving like crazy people, and the odds of us getting the right to kill somebody else pretty high. So we, we have cops out there to keep people from going over the 55 mile an hour speed limit. Those are rules and stuff that we have in place to prevent and control spillovers. To keep bad people like Preston from doing too much damage to society, from taking an over fair share of resources from society. And then we have controls in place to help reward people for the positive kind of crap you think they have. Most of y'all here on financial aid. Let's say it was like 90% of y'all were on financial aid. Why is the government paying you money to come to college? Because y'all already said going to college is going to benefit you. You're going to make a whole lot more money than seven and a quarter an hour when you graduate. So it should be in your best interest to come to college anyway. Well, why in the crap aren't you doing it even if you got to go get a bank loan? Why is the government helping you? Because they know financially we'll let more of you come. And the more of you we can get into college, the more of you will stay employed, the less of you will turn out like rest of you. Also, right, we'll get more income taxes that you collect. And then more income taxes on the collection of the that you pay in your what They'll get it back. Right. That's the plan. 
protecting consumers in multiple ways. Number one is to make sure there's competition. Because if there is no competition, you have a monopoly that they can charge whatever they can charge, and they, they have the power, they have control, and they can do whatever they want. We'll talk more about that next semester. That's not good for customers. So the government's going to try to keep businesses from becoming monopolies. <coughs> so that's why the government's looking at, well, you know, Sprint, yeah, y'all suck as a cell phone company, and T-Mobile, well, y'all are all right, but y'all are kind of small, but we don't know if we're going to let y'all two merge together, because then there'll only be three cell phone companies instead of four. Let's make the U.S. study right now, all Twitter. And it's just going to be three phone companies left. Well, then what happens if one of those starts struggling, and then we only have with two cell phone companies? Then we end up with one cell phone company, then they can charge whatever crap they want, because we got to have our iPhone 15. All right, 30 years from now. <laughs> So, that try to maintain and encourage cooperation. The other way of protecting consumers is to make sure that evil companies aren't doing evil things, like making sure the toy companies aren't using lead paint if your one-year-old kid is going to be sucking the paint off of the toys and getting cancer and that kind of thing, right? To protect labor, among other things, minimum wage law. I kind of fall behind on that one. But other things like OSHA, you've heard of that? Occupational Safety and Health Administration, they come in and they inspect businesses to make sure that workplaces are safe. Redistribution of income. This is the government playing Robin Hood. They take money from people who have jobs and give it to money who need jobs. Take money from people who have an income, give it to people who don't have income. Take money from young people, give it to old people. Take money from to help provide for people that can't provide for themselves. Reallocation of resources. Research grants, solution control, education subsidies, that kind of stuff. Let's face it, the government can say, well, we can sit here and we can spend $20,000 a year for the next 20 years keeping Preston in jail. Or we could take, I don't know, $20,000, $30,000 and send him to college instead. So we spend less to send him to college than we would to keep him in prison. And then hopefully when he graduates from college, he'll end up getting a job, keeping a job, and not turning a life of crime, and end up having to go to prison, and we end up being better off as a reallocating resources. So as a result, we have more people in college with these programs than we would have without these programs. Right? That's reallocating resources. I'm sorry, President. I'm sorry you like that now. <laughs> I mean, he hadn't smiled yet, and I was to make sure I hadn't made him mad. Just then, that made just be angry criminally. But <laughs> providing what uh, Sam said right off the bat, providing goods and services, uh, basically services, military protection, highways, fire departments, hospitals, rescue squads, working street lights, uh, flood insurance if you're in a flood prone zone, FEMA to come in late and. Try to help you maybe clean up a little bit, clean up the dead fish off the ice. Board. I saw that. Have you seen that picture? <laughs> uh, I did not know that that existed until somebody told me a couple days ago. So, freaking out. Stabilization. Try to keep the economy from going too far one way or the other. Control unemployment. If prices are too high, they'll do things to make prices get lower. If unemployment's too high, they'll do things to try to get unemployment lower. If it, Economy is growing too fast, it'll slow down. If it's growing too slow, they'll speed it up. Here's things they can do, which we'll talk about in upcoming chapters about fiscal and, fiscal and monetary policy. So, our government has a job. We elect people to do these jobs. I'll let you judge how well they do it. Not really. But, we're all the government into the economy. The federal government has two economic tools to run that stabilization thing. Number one is monetary policies where they mess with the money supply and credit. They think y'all aren't spending enough. Y'all aren't spending enough, and if y'all aren't spending enough, y'all aren't buying enough. Which is why they say you ain't spending enough. So if we ain't buying enough to keep everybody employed, what's going to happen? We're going to have a bunch of people out of work. Right? So we don't want a bunch of people out of work, so we need Americans to buy more. So there's things we can do to get Americans to buy more, like lower interest rates, so it's easier for Americans to borrow money. To create more money, because if you got more dollar bills in your pocket, you're more likely to spend them. If you have less dollar bills in your pocket, you're less likely to spend them. They can do that kind of stuff as monetary policy 
to encourage spending if they think more spending is needed. They can raise interest rates or reduce the money supply if they want to slow down spending because prices are getting too high. We'll talk more about that in a later chapter. Fiscal policies, this is the spending and taxation policies of the government. When they actively, consciously make the decision, well, we're going to spend $20,000 on bullets, $80,000 on ink cartridges. Because sometimes the government buys things, not because buying the thing is a good idea, but we're going to buy the thing because the fact that we buy it is going to have some kind of impact on the economy. Did y'all follow? You people remember the price floors, price ceilings that we talked about? The government is buying leftover broccoli, not because they want the broccoli, not because they need the broccoli. They're buying leftover broccoli because they'll keep farmers in business. To try to get us out of the recession in 2008 and 2009, President Obama and Congress, they got together and they came up with a stimulus plan. Have y'all heard the word stimulus? Well, they decided, well, back in 2002, okay, quick history, 2001, Airplanes hit buildings, boom, the economy slowed down. People are scared to go spend our economy slowed down. So the government said, well, we want to increase spending because people are sitting at home scared instead of spending, and if they ain't spending, then businesses aren't selling, so they're laying people off. So we want to reverse that. We want to get people spending more, so the government gave everybody checks. We got a $600 check in one year, in 2002, maybe, I guess. And then in 2003, or maybe it was the end of 2002, we got a $600 check, and then later we got another $300 check. It was a rebate, and that does thing, they didn't make that message quite clear. It was a tax rebate. We sort of got our tax refund, part of our tax refund early is really what they were doing there. They gave us extra money, hoping that we would spend that extra money, and by spending that extra money, that would create more jobs to stop the slowdown. Well, part of the problem is that, well, there's a couple of things going on there. Number one is a lot of people were like, well, this is extra money. This is found under the couch cushions money. Some people were like, well, let's use it to pay off our, some of our credit card debt. Good decision, but was anything new being bought? No, no jobs created. Other people were like, dude, uh, something is a new hot technology that now I got an extra $600 I can now afford to buy, a DVD player. <laughs> they weren't really around until the early 2000s. So a bunch of people were buying DVD players. And what were they buying? Sony's. Made in Japan. We weren't creating jobs here in America. We were creating <laughs> jobs in Japan. So that giving us money didn't quite work out the way they expected. So in 2008, 2009, when we had to do another round of stimulus, they're like, well, giving the people the money, we can't trust them to do what we want them to do, spend it here in America. So let's, just so let's figure out ways we can spend the money that has to be spent here in America. So instead of putting it in your hands and my hands, the government kept it and they spent it themselves. But let's fix schools, fix bridges, fix highways, that kind of stuff. They increased their spending and they're spending more than they should to try to create jobs. <laughs> Whether the school needed painting or not, they painted it. Whether the potholes needed filling or not, they filled them. That's the kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good idea to paint schools. Yeah, it's a good idea to fill the potholes, but that wasn't their thinking. They're like, we're going to spend money to create jobs, and now we just got to figure out how we're going to spend that money. Working. That's just the detail. But we decided we're going to spend more. That is a fiscal policy decision. We're going to spend more was a decision because we want to create jobs was a decision. Now let's figure out what we can spend it on. And then the unfortunate thing there is, how long does it take to fix a bridge? Why? A long time because the engineers got to go through there and they got to do the whatever studies and come up with plans and the environmental impact plan. Research has to be done and all that kind of stuff. Then you got to send it out for all the construction companies to bid on and that kind of stuff. The problem there is it took a long time. Some of those stimulus program things just wound up in the last years or eight years later. That money finally got spent. Well, what? So, apparently I lied when I said we were going to finish that. Well, I didn't promise that we were going to finish that. You said you bet you won. No, I said I bet we get more than three. I didn't bet that we finished. I thought we would, but we won't. But we will Tuesday. Well, I hope. Okay, one more slide. Okay. May I? Yeah. Go ahead. Go for it. All right, one last thing that the government does. <laughs> the, whole, the whole Robin Hood thing. 
is income transfers. They're, they're paying some people for stuff that people don't have to do anything in return for. You don't have to work to get this money. Social Security, what do you have to do to get the money? Be old, right? You turn 62 or 67 or 70, depending on when you decide to go up there, say you owe me money. You just have to turn old. And then the checks start coming in, you don't have to do anything in return. Welfare, what do you got to do to get it? Be poor. The government's not going to say, well, yeah, you poor. Well, come to work for us three days a week, sweeping the streets. We'll give you money. No, that's a job. This is extra money. And you have unemployment benefits. What do you got to have? No job, right? And so they manage these programs as part of the Robin Hood, give them those who have and take, take from those who have and give them those who don't have. I'm not sure to get social security. Hmm? Don't you want to get social security? Do and I if, if a lot of people don't work, the unemployment takes from social security. We'll talk more about these later just in Husker, but unemployment lasts only a short time, welfare lasts a short time, social security is well worth it. Anyway, so we get for these subscribers. Um, see you whatever the day is. Tuesday. And bye and drive safely.